One of the really important principles in the practice is learning how to be a self-starter and a self-maintainer. Realizing that your goodness cannot depend on other people's goodness. And although it's good to have a group of people whose collective strength you can draw strength from, you have to learn how to grow up and be independent so that your determination in the practice is based on your desire for true happiness. It doesn't have to rely on other people's approving or not approving, or other people cooperating or not cooperating. I received a letter this evening from an elderly woman I've known for many years now. She was a wife of one of my professors college. And she was commenting on how sad the world is. She's getting old, living in a retirement home. Many of her friends have died. And she looks around at the world and it's insane. And she'd done a lot of work in trying to develop international peace, international harmony. And of course, look at the situation. And it's very sad. It seemed like she was really weakened by the state of the world. Because you wonder if the world has ever been in a good shape, a good place to be. There's always conflict someplace. There are some horrendous events that we've heard about, and a lot of horrendous events that we've never heard about at all. The things that history tends to brush over. But there was a rebellion in 19th century China where about 18 million people were killed. Hardly anybody knows about it, at least here in the West. This sort of stuff goes on and on and on. And you can't let the large numbers of evil or stupid or both evil and stupid people get you down. You've got to learn how to be a self-starter, realizing if there's going to be any happiness in the world, it has to start within each individual person. If there's going to be any peace, it has to start within each individual person. And so which person are you responsible for? As John Sweat used to say, you've got only one person you're responsible for, and that's you. And you can't let the unskillfulness of the people around you affect your own actions. There's that sutta where Sarabhuta hears that a lay person who used to be one of his supporters has fallen under bad influences and is leading a very corrupt life. So Sarabhuta goes to see him and asks him, I hope you're still being heedful in the practice. And the guy's frank enough to say, well, how can that be? I've got so many things I've got to look after. I've got to look after my family. I've got to look after this, that, and the other thing. And Sarput says, what kind of excuse is that? Suppose you were to die, and the hell, hell wardens were coming to, get, coming to get you, and you tried to explain, well, the reason I misbehaved was because I had to look after my wife and children, and the, the hell wardens would just throw you right into hell. They wouldn't even give you a chance to finish your sentence. You can't use other people's behavior as an excuse for your own misbehavior, whether it's one other person or two or three or the whole world. You have to look at your own responsibility for your actions and make sure you do your best, regardless of the people around you. Now, it does help to know that there are other people who are trying to be skillful. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha established the monastic Sangha, to create a community where people can encourage one another in these ways. And even if you're not around the monastic Sangha, 
or if you happen to be in a branch of the monastic sangha that's not all that inspiring. You can think about the fact that there are inspiring people out there someplace, that the human race is not a total washout. That can give you some encouragement. But ultimately it has to come down to your own desire to find a happiness that doesn't betray you, doesn't turn on you. This is why the Buddha said one of the customs of the Noble Ones is to take delight in abandoning and delight in developing. And that relates to the factor of right effort in the path. There are actually four different kinds of right effort that the Buddha lays out. One is if you see that there are some unskillful tendencies you have. They're not in the mind at the moment, but you know that they could arise. You can do what you can to prevent them. This is an aspect of practice that many people overlook. You're looking basically at the present, but also into the future, knowing that things are okay right now, maybe, but the mind's going to be tempted down the line. How do you prevent that from happening? For instance, lust may not be showing many signs, may not be stirring at all, but you know that it's totally done with? Well, you know, you know it's not totally done with, so you've got to do something about it to prevent it from arising. And don't wait until it's arisen before you start scrambling to find some way of getting it under control. This is one of the reasons why we have that meditation on the parts of the body or the meditation on the elements of the body, to establish a set of associations to the mind. You look at a body and you don't just stop at the skin. You go a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper what's in there. Look at the whole thing. This applies to your body, other people's bodies. And if you get used to thinking in this way, then when thoughts of lust come up, you've got your tools already sharpened. Or in social situations, you know you're going to go someplace and there are people who know how to push your buttons. know how to provoke you. How can you prepare so that you know that no matter what they say or what they do, you're not going to get provoked? Sitting down and planning this out is an important part of the practice. We can plan so many other things. We can plan our itineraries on a trip. We can plan our grocery list. Why can't we plan how to handle a situation skillfully, knowing that there are situations that tend to provoke you? There are people who tend to provoke you. All of this comes under preventing something unskillful from arising. If an unskillful mental state has arisen, then you try to abandon it as quickly as you can. As the Buddha said, you treat it as if it were a fire in your hair. Or in a turban on your head. In other words, you don't just wait around and sort of enjoy the pleasure of the unskillful state before you start thinking about doing away with it. It's interesting that when the Buddha talks about this process, he says you have to arouse your mindfulness here. This is one of those passages in the canon that show definitively that when the Buddha is talking about mindfulness, he's not talking about a nice, broad, accepting, equanimous mind state. You're not equanimous about the fire on your head. You want to put it out as quickly as you can. So what are your tools? You do want to have them sharpened beforehand, but if something totally unexpected comes up, this is a point where it's useful to think about the mind as a committee. Not everybody in the committee is siding with that unskillful state. Make sure at least that you have a couple members 
that are stepping back, not giving their approval. So even though the, there's no way that you can immediately stop the others, at least you're not totally going along with them. And that gives you the chance to observe them. What kind of reasoning do they use? Usually it's pretty bad. That's one of the reasons why these members tend to shout. Just like those wacko TV commentators. They don't have reason on their side, so they just shout at people. Well, the mind does that too. But you want to look for what their reasoning is. There's usually something very peculiar. They're very short-sighted. And if you can catch it, you've got your weapon. Because you have to remember that each member, in your committee at least, wants happiness. But all the different members have some very unusual ideas about how happiness may be found. But if you can catch where there's something short-sighted or very, very narrow in some of their ways of thinking about happiness or the ways to happiness, you can point it out to them. And there will be some members of the committee that will be willing to listen. And don't be dismayed if you can't get everybody to agree with you right away. And they may sneer at you and be snide and say, oh, it's, you're going to give in anyhow, so why not give in now? Well, that's just one of their tricks. Don't fall for it. This way you find that you can start putting out the fire. So that's the second form of skillful action, second form of right effort. The third form is if there are skillful states that you would like and they haven't arisen, well, you do what you can to foster them. There's an interesting passage in Ajahn Chah. I was translating one of his Dharma talks recently. and As you know, Ajahn Chah is usually characterized as having one teaching, let go. Well, there's a lot more to Ajahn Chah than you might suspect. There's a monk who comes to see him and talks about how much he wants to get his mind to calm down. And Ajahn Chah doesn't say, well, just learn to accept the fact that the mind doesn't calm down. He says, no, look, see what's not allowing it to calm down. There's a reason someplace. Examine. Try to find the reason. John Chavez, in the same mood, was one time saying, suppose someone sees you carrying a banana back from the market and they ask you, what are you going to do with a banana? He said, we're going to eat it. Are you going to eat the peel too? Well, no. Then why are you carrying the peel? And John Chavez said, how are you going to answer him? He says, you answer through desire and you answer through discernment. In other words, there's certain desires and certain needs you have on the path that you have to recognize. There's certain things you can't let go right away. There's certain things you have to develop and hold on to. In the case of the banana, you said the time hasn't come yet to throw the peel away. You need the peel to hold the banana so it doesn't get all squishy in your hands. In other words, so, so that you can eat it, you hold the peel, even though you're not going to eat the peel. The same with the path. Eventually you do let go of the path once it's done its work, but you have to develop it so it can do its work to begin with. So look at what's missing in your path. How's your virtue? How's your concentration? How's your discernment? What are the ways of developing these things? And it's okay to want these things. If you don't want them, they're not going to happen. Remembering an important part of right effort is generating desire. And how are you going to overcome your unskillful desires unless you've got some skillful desires that remind you there's a better happiness, there's a better way? Then you take those desires and you focus them on the causes. What helps you maintain the precepts? What helps you develop concentration? But it helps you sharpen your discernment. Try to give rise to those things.
for example, with concentration. You can't just order the mind to be still, but you can find something you find interesting in the present moment. Something that makes it pleasant for the mind to be here, i.e. the breath. There's lots you can do with the breath. You can make it go up, you can make it go down, you can make it long, you can make it short. There are many levels of breath energy in the body. Which one would you like to tune into that you find most interesting? The in and out breath or the breath that goes through the different muscles, that goes through the different blood vessels? breath that goes through the bones. There's lots of levels of breath energy. It's like the ocean. There are many levels of currents. There's some currents on the surface. There's some currents that go deeper. And they go at different speeds. For all the different radio waves going through the air right now. There's stations in San Diego, stations in Los Angeles, stations in Tijuana. Shortwave radio stations, transmitters all over the world depending on the kind of radio you have and how you tune it, you can pick up all kinds of messages. That's the same with the breath. To what extent can you detect different levels of breath energy in the body? They're all there. It's just a matter of tuning into them. The same with the different elements in the body. There's earth, there's water, there's wind, fire. There's space permeating throughout the body and going around the body. There's the element of consciousness. Space and consciousness in particular require a lot of good, solid concentration for you to be able to stay with them consistently. This is why we work with the breath and the other physical elements to begin with. But as your concentration gets more subtle, you can begin to pick things up that you didn't see before. It's like getting a better radio that picks up subtle signals from far away. And when you find that you actually can stay with these things, then you try to maintain and develop those skillful qualities. It's not the case that concentration arises and you try to be ahead of the game by saying, well, I'll just watch it come and then watch it go, and then I'll be seeing inconstancy or impermanence or whatever. That's not right effort. I was reading a book a while back saying that the Buddha taught two different ways of practice. One was right mindfulness and the other was right effort, and they're two totally different practices. There's nowhere where the Buddha would separate them out like that. An important part of right mindfulness is ardency, i.e., you start out with right effort and then you go to right mindfulness. And right mindfulness includes the element of right effort in that quality of ardency. And then as your mindfulness develops, it moves into right concentration. As the Buddha said, the factors of the different establishings of mindfulness are the themes of right concentration. So as you go through those last three factors of the path, you find that right concentration envelops right mindfulness, and right mindfulness envelops right effort. They're all part of one another. So what do you do to maintain the concentration? You've got to value it. You've got to understand the process so that you can go through the day and still maintain some contact with the theme of your meditation, so that it can develop momentum. Keep the breath in mind. Keep in mind the, the determination that whatever you do, you want to do it skillfully. That helps keep you in touch with the path. Keeping the precepts, maintaining restraint over your senses. This doesn't mean that you put blinders on. Simply that if you're going to look at something, ask yourself, why am I looking? If you're going to listen, why am I listening? you're going to think about something. Why am I thinking about this? What am I trying to get out of this? Is this motivated by a skillful intention or an unskillful one? If it's mo motivated by an unskillful intention, remind yourself you're going to have to clean up the mess when you sit down to meditate. 
So why bother creating the mess to begin with? This is how all four aspects of right effort come together. By abandoning unskillful qualities, it makes it a lot easier to give rise to and maintain the skillful ones. So remember, you've got four duties here, four types of right effort, and you want to learn how to develop them all. Because that's how you maintain your effort. That's how you become self-reliant on the path. You strengthen the, the good members of the committee and the mind, and you learn how to sidestep the unskillful ones and win them over if you can, and exile the ones that you can't. That way you find when you wake up in the morning, you've got a good group of people to wake up together with. Good group of people to get you started the right way on the day. And so even though you may be out practicing alone, you're not really alone. You've got a good committee inside. 